Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We honor your word. We receive it this day, written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation of what you're bringing forth. We will be hearers and doers of it and see the fruit of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Today we're going to begin to share with you on the subject of the mind. The mind is a very important area which you must master and govern according to the Word of God. Today we're going to talk about obtaining the mind of Christ. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 says, As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. First of all, we make a note here that the word heart is not the correct word in the Hebrew. The Hebrew word is nefesh, which means soul. Young's literal translations corrects this error. I can even show you the fact that it's not heart, because look at this verse in the King James. The heart is used twice. The other word for heart is the correct word, lab. And if you're here for the first time, on the screen we have in the lower window the Strong's number with the, the word in the Hebrew or Greek and meanings and different things that we point out. This is the word lab, which means the inner man or the heart, translated heart continually throughout the Word of God, 508 times of the 592 uses. So this is talking about as he thinketh in his soul. And this would refer to where do we think in the soulless realm, which is our will, intellect, and emotions? It's in our mind. So this is talking as you think in your mind, so are you. That means your mind is pretty important. If your mind's not thinking correctly, you're going to be on the wrong track. God wants us to get our mind renewed to the Word of God. And we can see this happen. One thing we must realize is that you aren't going to figure things out yourself. It's going to be a revelation from the Lord who's going to do this. Romans 11.34 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who, or who hath been his counselor? Can we know the mind of the Lord? Well, we can. Nobody's known the mind of the Lord unless he reveals it to them, and he will reveal it to us. We see a scripture that shows that we can have this mind over in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20. We know the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. This means the mind is a faculty of understanding meaning the fact that we can have an understanding in our minds so we can perceive things correctly, that we may know him that is true, and that we are in him that is true, even as the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Notice, we can have a understanding in the mind that we may know him. And the purpose for you to get the understanding of the Word of God and get the mind of Christ is to know him, as well as to walk in his ways and to overcome all enemies that would be arrayed against you. Now we have to understand, as Isaiah ch says in chapter 55, Isaiah chapter 55, we begin in verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. An unrighteous man's thoughts are are not going to be God's thoughts, that's for sure. They're evil. Let him return unto the Lord. He'll have mercy upon him and to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. That means the thoughts that you and I would have just from the human nature are not his thoughts. And our ways that we would just want to do just from a human nature standpoint are not his ways. We must get his thoughts and his ways into us. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts, because his thoughts and his ways are the ways of the Spirit. And they're revealed by spiritual revelation by the Holy Spirit. He says, As the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Well, it's to accomplish what he pleases, to bring forth all that he purposes for us in our life, and it's to prosper in your life as he brings revelation to you, and you take hold of it and be a doer of it. 
Well, if we're going to get his thoughts, then we've got to get his word in us. This is why we do what we do to bring forth the word of God, scripture after scripture, point after point, on subject after subject. This is what the word of God instructs all preachers to do. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 9. Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed. He sought out and set in order the many Proverbs. He's got to get in and study the Word and find out every single scripture on every single subject. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. That which was written was upright, even words of truth. What are acceptable words? The Word of God. Not jokes, not stories, not social sermons, not opinions. No, the Word of God. That's why we bring scripture after scripture, point after point, as we must get the Word of God in us. Now, as we are hearing the Word of God, what is going to happen in the New Testament? We see in Hebrews chapter 8, in verse 10, it speaks of what happens as you hear the Word. Hebrews 8.10, This is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. We see the opposite spoken in 10.16 of Hebrews. This is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. So he's going to take his word, he's going to write it in our heart, and write it in our mind by the Holy Spirit. Now, Luke chapter 24 tells us something important that we must understand. 24, in verse 45, this is when Jesus brought revelation of the scriptures to those disciples after he was raised from the dead here. It says, then opened he their, now the word understanding is not the right word as far as what the correct translation should be. It is the word nous, which means mind. It shouldn't be translated understanding, it's the word translated mind 21 of the 24 times correctly. That they might understand, and this is the true word for understanding in the Greek, Sunni Amy. And so he opened their minds. Young's didn't even pick this one up for some reason. I don't know why. Then opened he their minds that they might understand the scriptures. That shows you. God is going to open up your mind so you can get revelation and understanding the scriptures. This is what the Holy Spirit will do. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. That's why they've got to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. For we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that we have freely given to us of God. When you receive the Holy Spirit, He dwells in you, now He is going to bring revelation to you. And notice it that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. God wants us to get the knowledge of the Word of God so we know all that He has given to us, all that He instructs us to do. Verse 13, Which things also we speak, and not on the words which man's wisdom teach, we're not going to teach man's wisdom, that's for sure, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, bring spiritual revelation of the truth. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. That means we're not going to try to figure it out in our minds, in the natural. We're not going to try to interpret the Scriptures. It's revelation by the Holy Spirit. For they're foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. Knowledge is spiritually discerned, revealed by the Holy Spirit. He goes on, says, He that's spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? And he says, but we have the mind of Christ. How did they get the mind of Christ? Because they got the word in them, revealed by the Holy Spirit. The word written in their mind, 
They study the Word. They receive the spiritual revelation of it by the Holy Spirit. One thing we must understand is that it is spiritual revelation. We see so much error in the body of Christ today because people have been interpreting the scriptures, which is a mistake. Instead, we receive revelation of the scriptures. We see this spoken of in the prayer that was prayed for the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And this word knowledge is the word epigenosis, which means precise, correct knowledge. We're to get precise, correct, accurate knowledge of the word of God. Not what we think it says, or not interpreting it. No, we're going to get exact revelation in the precise, correct knowledge of God, and that's what God will bring revelation through the Holy Spirit. The eyes, talking about the spiritual eyes, of your mind, and to be able to understand, being enlightened, it's going to be enlightened, so you'll be able to see. Again, you can't figure this out yourself. It's all God bringing revelation to you, that you may know again the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. What's the exceeding greatness of his power to us were, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. We see another scripture over in Colossians, praying similar. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. He says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, desire that you might be filled with the knowledge. Epigenosis, again, is the word precise, correct knowledge. God wants you filled with a precise, correct knowledge of his will. And his will is the word of God in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He's the one who imparts wisdom to you and imparts spiritual understanding to you. And this is absolutely necessary that you might walk worthy of the Lord into all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. There's no way you can walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing and be fruitful and see God accomplish what he purposes without getting knowledge, understanding, and wisdom revealed by him. This is why what we're to do in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, If you then be risen with Christ, you're born again, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. We're going to seek the things above which are the spiritual ways of the Lord according to the new covenant. Set your affection. This is a word phreneo, which means to gain understanding, to be able to have understanding on things above, not on things on the earth. Otherwise, we don't be looking at all these things on the earthly things, mining earthly things. Instead, we're to seek the things above. We want to get revelation of the spiritual ways of heaven's ways. He goes on and says, for you are dead. Or more literally, you did die. The old you is dead and gone because you've got a brand new spirit on the inside of you, the spirit of Christ. And your life is hid or has been hid with Christ in God. What is the spirit that you have? It's the spirit of Christ. We all have the spirit of Christ. And now with the spirit of Christ, we are to now live according to the word of God. That shows us something else that, of course, we must do. We're going to get our mind renewed to the truth of the Word of God. We come to Romans chapter 12. First of all, verse 1, he says this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, that's your reasonable service. We're to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Remember, our body has sin dwelling in it, Nonetheless, we are to present it as a living sacrifice and not yield to it because we're going to walk according to the word of God. Be not conformed to this world. Uh, we can't be conformed to this world. Actually, the word world here is the word age. That's the word aeon in the Greek. The age, this age, which is an age run by the enemy because Satan, who is the god of this age, 
until the time of the end of the church age, which is coming soon. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transform is a Greek word, metamorpho. This is where we get the word metamorphosis. And if you remember from science class, metamorphosis was the, the, where there was a change of the caterpillar into a butterfly, a change of species. Well, that's what's going to happen with you. You're going to be changed from a carnal-minded, earthly-minded person after the human nature to one who is heavenly-minded, spiritually-minded, having the mind of Jesus Christ, which is what he wants. And how's it going to happen? By the renewing of your mind. And this word here means really a, a renovation, a complete change for the better, a total renovation. That means everything that we have known be before, or it's going to be all changed. We are going to get new ways uh, now in our mind as we get totally renovated. Your mind's going to be, have a complete change to be renewed to the ways of the Lord. So if we're going to see this happen, it's going to be through the Word of God. And one thing is we must have the right attitude regarding the Word. When the Word comes to you, you need to be ready to receive it ready to accept what God is bringing to you, and then to take hold of it and apply it in your life. James 1.21 says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. The word engrafted here is a word which actually means to be implanted. It's being implanted in us. It's implanted in your mind. It's implanted in your heart. It's being written there, as we saw, put and written in you. It's not just something that you got a bunch of facts in, in from a knowledge standpoint. It's actually being written in you by the Lord. It's tremendous what God does through the Word of God in us. At the same time, as we are receiving that which is coming to us, we want to be sure that we're only receiving that which is in line with His Word. Acts chapter 17 here it's speaking in verse 10 about those who were the Bereans. The brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming hither went in the synagogue of the Jews. And it says these, speaking of the Bereans, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. With all readiness of mind, they were ready to receive it, and they were going to search the Scriptures, examine this means, in order to see if it's so. If you don't examine the Scriptures to see if it's so, you could be receiving false things. Because of the age of the Internet, we see so many Christians seem to get out on the Internet and look at all these different things, and they seem to run across all kinds of false stuff. You've got to be really wise about what you are receiving when you're looking out there. There is a lot of false things that are out there. You must check everything out in line with the Scriptures. We have lots of problems in doctrine in the body of Christ because of the fact that uh, the, there hasn't been a search into the Scriptures like there should be to see the truth of the Word of God. You've got to find out whether the things are so or not. Now, as you are receiving the Word, we must understand also what needs to be done in relation to our mind. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. He says that you put off, put aside, put away. Concerning the former conversation, this means manner of life, not just your talk. It's your overall manner of life conduct. The former behavior the old man. Well, that's the way you were before you got born again, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So where does this old man desires and thoughts come from? From the human nature, from the flesh. It's corrupt according to the deceitful lust of the flesh. It has not been changed, remember. When you got born again, you got a new spirit. You didn't get a new body. You got the same flesh, and it is corrupt with the deceitful lust. And... Be renewed, it says here, in the spirit of your mind. Now, when it talks about being renewed in the spirit, it would be better understanding of this because this conjunction here, when it speaks of this, 
This is a dative, and you may not know Greek, but I just want to point this out to you. This is a dative case where it says in the spirit. This is the word the, and this is the word for spirit. In the dative, it refers to usually something that's translated to something, to something. It would be better translated, be renewed to the spirit, because what is happening? Your mind is getting renewed to the spirit of your minds. And it's actually this word here is, is uh, talking about mind. It's talking about in the way, you're, your way of thinking, your way of reasoning. So you're going to be renewed to the spirit, because what do we need? We need to get a spiritual mind. We can't have a carnal mind. We've got to have a mind that's after the way of the spirit. And he goes on and says how this is going to happen. And that you put on the new man as this renewing is coming. And the word put on is a word and duo, which means to like sink into clothing and really to clothe yourself. And when it talks about this, it's interesting. This is a middle voice in the Greek. The Greek middle voice means the subject is doing the action for himself. Meaning then that you put on or clothe yourselves for your own benefit, the new man. The new man is now the spiritual man that's going to come into your mind for a new way of thinking, new way of living according to the word of God, the way of the spirit, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You got a new spirit, you got a new heart on the inside of you, and this new man is to be put on. You are to clothe yourself with the new man. We see this also spoken of over in Colossians. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. He said, Now you're to put off all these, these are all works of the flesh, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, that should be eliminated. Lie not one to another, seeing you put off the old man with his deeds. All the works of the old man need to be eliminated. That's why you crucify the flesh daily and you deny yourself and anything that's not in line with the word of God. And have put on, again, and duo, clothing yourself with the new man, which is how? Renewed in knowledge. And this is epigenosis again, precise, correct knowledge, after the image of him that created him. And so you're being renewed in knowledge after the image of him. That's how you're going to get the mind of Christ being put in you. You're going to put on the new man. How? By the renewing of the knowledge of God. The new word of God, the word of God that's going to be spiritual revelation is going to be written in your heart and written in your mind. Now that brings us to another point. What do we do with this mind of the flesh? We have all these thoughts that are coming from a carnal mind, a human nature situation that we all do have flesh. Romans chapter 7, verse 15, Paul addresses this. He says, that which I do, I allow not. That which I will, would or will to do, that do I not. He's not doing the things he wants to do, and he's doing the things he doesn't want to do. But what I hate, that I do. Something else is driving him. If then I do that which I would not, I consent of the law that it's good. Now, then it's no more I that do it, but sin that's dwelling in me. Since it's something I don't want to do and it's not good, something else is operating through me. Sin is dwelling in him. He goes on and says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, not talking about in the heart or in the spirit, he's talking about in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Can you ever trust the carnal mind? Can you ever trust the human nature? Can you ever trust the desires that come from just a human nature attitudes? No. It dwells no good thing. For the will is present with me. I have the will to want to do what's right. But how to perform that which is good I find not. He didn't know how to deal with that, overcome that. The good that I would, I do not. The evil that I would not, I'm doing. Again, no doing the wrong things. Now, if I do that I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He reiterates this. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. That doesn't mean we have two natures. We have one nature, the spirit of Christ, but we have a flesh that has not been changed. Evil is in the flesh. 
I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That's the new inward man on the inside of you, the hidden man of the heart. You've got a brand new heart when we're born again. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin that's in my members. So where is this law of sin operating? In your members, in the flesh. So he says, O wretched man that I am, man, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You've got to realize your body is a body of death. Of course, it's dying slowly uh, until, you know, as throughout your life. I thank God, though, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. That shows you. You can be yielding to a mind that's renewed to the word of God, and you'll serve the law of God. Or you could be having your mind influenced by the flesh carnal, deceitful desires, lusts of the flesh, and you'll end up serving the law of sin. You and I must crucify the flesh daily, and you must learn to recognize the thoughts and desires that are coming from the flesh. Anything that's inconsistent with the Word of God, it's not coming from God, and you need to be sure that you're going to overcome that and cast that down and not give place to it. We come now to Romans 8. Verse 5, and here's another important point for you to be able to have the mind of Christ. Part of it is where your focus is. He says, for they that are after the flesh, if you're after what I want to do from a human nature standpoint, without thinking what the Word says, then you'll mind the things of the flesh. That's where your mind will be set. You'll be affected by it. But they that are after the Spirit, how can I be after the Spirit? I'm thinking about what is the spiritual desires that God has for me. The way of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If I'm after the Spirit, I'm going to think, what does the Word say in every situation? Then I will be minding the things of the Spirit. God wants you to get a spiritual mind, not a carnal mind. He goes on in verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. That's one run by the flesh or influenced by fleshly desires. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. A spiritual mind is a word-ruled mind, a mind renewed to the word, the mind of Christ established in you, spiritual revelation, you're thinking on what the word says in every situation. And that produces life and peace. The carnal mind is enmity. It's actually hostile to God. It's an opposition to him for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then he says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you are walking in the flesh, we cannot please God. The only way we can walk and, and please God is by walking in the Spirit. And they are going to be contrary one to another, remember? We look over in Galatians chapter 5, and we see in verse 16, he says, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not, or you might not, more, it's not, a, it's not a shall not, it's a subjunctive mood verb, which is a conditional statement. You might not, it would be the better way to translate it from the Greek, you might not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Meaning, the condition is, so you don't yield to the flesh, is walking in the spirit according to the word. And he says, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. They're contrary. Your spirit will always want to do what the Word says. Your flesh will not want to do it. That's why one of the main things that affects you is your feelings. Well, I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like doing that. Well, that's the enemy working at you through the flesh trying to stop you from doing the things that God wants. You cannot go by your feelings. You must go by the Word of God. Make sure that you are not giving place to the flesh because they are going to war against each other. They are against each other. So we've got to get the Word in us. Now, suppose we don't have the knowledge of God. Well, we're going to be walking in sin left and right. Are we going to be able to plead ignorance just because we don't know the Word of God? No. In Leviticus chapter 5, verse 17, it says this, If a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist, this is an old English word which really means know, the Hebrew word yada, though he knows it not, yet he's guilty and shall bear his iniquity. Meaning, 
Even though he doesn't know it, he's still guilty because he's supposed to know the commandments of the Lord. You and I must get the knowledge of God. We are responsible to study the Word, to learn the Word, to know the Word, and then to be a doer of it. We can't plead ignorance. If we don't know it, we're still guilty, and we're still going to bear our iniquity. This is why getting the knowledge of God is absolutely essential for you in your life. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 13, tells us something. He says, Therefore my people are gone into captivity. Why? Because they have no knowledge. If we don't have the knowledge of God, we'll just walk in the flesh, we'll walk according to whatever we want, we won't know the ways of God, we won't know the promises, we won't know what He wants us to do, and we'll end up being in captivity to the enemy continually. We also see in Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, it tells us something else. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's not supposed to happen. We're supposed to walk in victory. Why in this case? Because thou hast rejected knowledge. In this case, knowledge came to them, but then they rejected it. Now that's why you and I must be ready to take hold of the word. Uh, we just don't just reject it and forget about it or cast it aside. No, they rejected knowledge. And notice what he says after that. He says, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I'll reject thee. Thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God, I also forget thy children. <laughs> That's quite an effect. God wants us to get the knowledge of God. Without the knowledge of God, we're going to be destroyed. And if we reject the knowledge of God, we're going to be destroyed as well. And we will not see God bringing forth what he purposes. Our thoughts are so important that we govern our thought life. The enemy will really try to work you in your mind as well as through your feelings. We see a scripture in Isaiah 65, verse 2, which is important to see and understand. He says, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. What was wrong with them? Which walketh in a way that was not good. And what was that? After their own thoughts. They didn't walk according to the word. If we walk after our own thoughts, we're walking in the flesh, we're walking in a way that's not good. And God would even consider us as a rebellious people in the sense that we haven't submitted to his word and done what he's told us to do. We can't walk after our own thoughts. Remember, his thoughts are not our thoughts. We need to get his thoughts in us through the word and then think on what the word says in every situation. This brings us to another point. Over in Romans chapter 1. It speaks of those in verse 21 who knew God at one time. Look what it says. Because that when they knew God, so they had a relationship with him, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. They became vain in their imaginations and their way of thinking, and their foolish heart was darkened. Obviously, they weren't walking in line with the word anymore. They had turned away from the Lord, and they just went downhill. They were claiming they were wise, but they came fools instead. Changed the glory of uncorruptible God into an image made to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Amazing that they would do such things. God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between them. And they get into the homosexuality. And it said they changed the truth of God into a lie even. They were just so deceived. And they worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. You can tell their eyes were not on the Lord anymore. Their eyes were on themselves. And then we come down to verse 28. And it says what God did. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they didn't want to think about what the word says. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That's a mind void uh, not approved, un, uh, a disapproved mind, is what this would mean, to do those things that are not convenient. God will give people over to a reprobate mind if they reject the way of the Lord. It even talks about those ones who don't walk after the love of the truth in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, they're going to have a strong delusion and believe a lie that the Antichrist is to who he's claiming to be God, which is going to be a lie. Why? Because they reject the truth. 
We must get the Word of God in us, and we can't reject it or not want to, in this case, like to retain God in their knowledge. Well, I, you know, I don't, I'm just going to walk in my own ways. Uh, you're going to be in trouble. He, these guys got given over to a reprobate mind, and then they start doing all these evil things, and it starts listing them all out here. In verse 29 and 30 and 31, all the different things that they did, knowing the judgment of God would come upon them because of their sinful ways. You and I must keep the Word of God first place in our life. Now, after you receive the Word, another thing we must know. We are accountable and responsible to walk in it. Remember, we can't plead ignorance, and then after we know it, we can't just ignore it. No. Hebrews 10.26 says this, For if we sin willfully, that means we know the truth, we have chosen to not walk in the truth, we've chosen to do something contrary to truth, walking in sin willfully. We know what we're doing. After that we've received the knowledge, we got the knowledge, but now we're not doing it, of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation which will devour the adversaries. What's going to happen if we don't walk in line with the word? A judgment will come. God expects you and me to walk in line with the word of God. How about those that have turned away and have, have rebelled against God and, and not walking the way they should? We see what it tells them that they must do in 2 Timothy 2, 24 and following. It says, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but must be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. In meekness, this is what we do for people that are not walking right. In meekness, you know, not mean, in a mean way, but gentleness and mild way. You've got to give it such a way that people can be receiving it. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Meaning, if a person's not walking in line with the Word, they're actually opposing themselves. They're against themselves because they're supposed to be walking in line with the Word of God. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the precise, correct knowledge of the truth. This word is not a, a, a participle with an ing on the end side of it, ing at the end of it. Instead, no, it's a word which is a noun. This is the word in the Greek. It's a noun. That's why we better translate it. We give them repentance to the precise, correct knowledge of the truth. Meaning, how can you come to repentance? By coming to the precise, correct knowledge of the truth. Meaning that they're gonna have, they've been opposing themselves. God will give them repentance when they come in line with the truth. They're going to have to change their mind, which is what repentance means. They're going to have to change their mind and start walking in line with the Word of God. You can't make people do things. They've got to choose the Word of God for themselves. You give them the Word, instruct them. They're opposing themselves. They need to receive the Word, come in line with the truth, start being a hearer and a doer of it in their own life. Then it goes on and says, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Notice what happens because someone opposes themselves. They're taken captive by the devil at the devil's will is what that's talking about. So, that also tells you something. You may give them the truth and they've come to repentance, but they're going to have to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. You're not going to be able to get them out of it. They have to, everybody has to work out their own salvation. Everybody has to recover themselves out of it and overcome and come out of all the areas of bondage and get set free. So everybody's responsible for what they're doing. This brings us to another point. In regards to dealing with the demons that have come into us from inheritance, our own sins, or victimization that would be affecting us in our mind. This is a case where the man from Gadara had the legion of demons. And in Mark 5, 15, they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion, legion sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. Sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. Let's over, go over to Luke's account. In Luke's account...
Verse 35 of Luke 8. They went out to see what was done, came to Jesus, and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus. That tells you a little bit more. When it was sitting, he just wasn't sitting like he was just sitting there by himself. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, who else was sitting at the feet of Jesus? Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, choosing to hear the word of God. So what does this mean? This person who's going to come out of bondage in his mind is going to get the word in him. He's going to hear the word of God because he's got to get his mind renewed so he's going to think correctly and deal with everything, that all the wrong things he's allowed coming into him. Also, clothe. This means he's clothed himself. And how do we clothe ourselves? Remember, we clothe ourselves by putting on the new man through the renewing of our mind. And in his right mind. So it's not just casting out the demons that get you free. It's getting the word in you, clothing yourself by the renewing of your mind, and then as the spirits are cast out and you get the mind of the Lord established in you, then you'll be in your right mind. Many people think, well, if I just cast out the demons, then I'll have, I'll, my mind will be fine. There'll be no more problems. Uh, that's part of it. But the other part is you've got to get your mind renewed. You've got to correct all the problems. You're going to have to clothe yourself and get renewed and walk in the ways of the Word of God. So then you'll be in the right mind. And that's important to understand. Many people have not understood that that seek after deliverance. They just want to get cast out and get free and think that's all they got to do. No, it's the whole package. First Corinthians, so we see something else also. Verse chapter 15 verse 34. Awake to righteousness. We are now to walk in the word of righteousness. Be endurers of the word of righteousness to be righteous. And sin not. Remember, if we're obedient to the word, it produces righteousness as we walk in the ways of the word of God. And we won't sin. And notice, he says, for some have not the knowledge of God. They're ignorant. Meaning if we're ignorant, we're going to continually walk in sin. So this is why in the measure that you know the word will be the measure that you'll be able to walk in righteousness because you'll know the way that's right to walk in. If you don't know the word, you could be walking in sin left and right, even though you don't want to, but nonetheless, you don't know what's right. You've got to learn the word of God and get exact, precise, correct knowledge. Now, when you get the word in you, then the Holy Spirit can be working to bring those thoughts from the word of God up to your mind. Proverbs 12, verse 5. The thoughts of the righteous are right. Well, what would be the thoughts of the righteous? Those would be thoughts that would be coming from you, from the word that's in your mind that would be in line with what is right in God's sight. They're right. That's what you want. So this is why scriptures come before you, or thoughts come before the Lord, or scriptural principles that come before you. These are thoughts that God is bringing into your mind. And he wants you to have these thoughts established in you. In fact, Proverbs 16 and verse 3 says, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. He wants them established, firm, set, because you're going to commit your works unto the Lord, which means you're going to walk in line with the Word of God. You're going to think what the Word says in every situation. You're not going to do what you want to do. You're going to do what the Word says. And your thoughts then, God will even get them established when you put the Word of God first place in your life. He wants you to be thinking correctly. Another thing that's important, of course, you can't have the Word in your mind and then have all this other way of thinking as well and think that you're going to have a mind that is going to see victory or see the promises come to pass. James 1, verse 7. Look what it says. Let not that man think that he shall, lambano is the word for receive, which means to take hold of, take hold of anything of the Lord. Now, why would that be that he can't do this? Because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. We can't be double-minded. We've got to be single-minded on the word. That means you've got to get the Word established in you. You know it. You're persuaded of it. You have the Word. It's established in you. You know the truth. You're not going to be wavering, tossed to and fro. No. Double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. We see also over in James 4, 
In verse 8, when it says, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. This is actually the word disukos, two-souled or double-minded. That tells you something else of why your mind has to get single-minded on the word. It's going to affect your heart. Your mind is one of the gates into your heart. You purify your heart by being single-minded on the word. If you're double-minded, it's affecting your heart adversely. God wants your heart and mind to be in line with the Word of God and in unity to it and be one-hearted and one-souled, one one-minded before the Lord. So the more you get your mind renewed to the truth and get rid of any double-mindedness, the more you're going to have a pure heart before the Lord. Another thing that we see is over in Philippians chapter 4. The enemy will try to work a course at you in your mind through situations and try to bring thoughts into your mind that are not what God wants in your mind, of course. It says, be careful for nothing. The word careful is the word marimno, which means to be anxious, to be troubled with cares, anxieties. We are not to be anxious, cares, worries, concerns, troubled with cares, any of these kind of things, for nothing. No. That means the enemy is come bringing that against you. Is that going to have you in peace? No. Is that going to have you in faith? No. It's going to, that's going to choke the word. Remember, the cares of this age choke the word. In everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request, which is your make a demand of what's due you, we've talked about this in the past, be made known unto God, what that word means. And then what will happen? The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall guard. This word keep is the word phraeo, which means to guard. It'll guard your heart and mind. Because your heart and your mind are to be in line with the word. They should be single-minded. Your heart's established in the word. Your mind's established. And you're not going to give place to anything attacking your mind. So anxiety, worries, cares, concerns are attacking your mind. They're trying to get you double-minded. You've got to cast those cares upon the Lord because He cares for you and refuse to let yourself be full of care or worry or anxiety about anything. And then in verse 8, it gives us a pretty good checklist of what you should be thinking upon. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, that be in line with the word that are the truth. Whatsoever things are honest, or this would be something that is honorable before God. This word will mean... Whatsoever things are just, this means righteous. Whatsoever things are pure, this would be something that's holy, pure, and clean. Whatsoever things are lovely, this means acceptable and pleasing to God. So it would be lying in the Word. Whatsoever things are of a good report, not the bad report. If there be any virtue, or this refers to moral excellence. And if there be any praise, does it bring praise unto God? Think on these things. Well, that means all these other things... You don't want to think on those things. You don't want to waste your time with your mind thinking on all kinds of negative things, you know, the bad report, anything that's not righteous or holy or clean or, or you know, what pleasing in God's sight or honorable before Him or not in line with the truth. God wants us to govern our mind by keeping our mind thinking on the right things. Well, what if negative things come into your mind? What should you do? Well... You are to do something with it. You just don't let that thought be in your mind without dealing with it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, says this. Casting down imaginations. This means reasonings. <clears throat> any kind of reasonings. <clears throat> you cast down any reasonings in your mind. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What would be something that's exalting itself against the knowledge of God? It's trying to replace the knowledge of God. Instead of what the Word says, it's trying to get ascend over that in your mind that you're going to think this or choose this way instead of what the Word says. And then also, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is an extremely important discipline for every Christian if you're going to walk in victory. You've got to learn to take captive every thought. Bring into captivity. Take it captive. 
Otherwise, I'm not going to have that. I'm going to cast that thing down. I'm going to replace it with the Word of God. I'm going to take it captive because I'm not going to let that be in my mind without replacing it with the Word of God. So I'm taking that captive and, bring, and, and replacing it with the truth of the Word to the obedience of Christ. And then it goes on and says, having in a readiness. This means to be prepared and ready. We should be this way, living our life every day, prepared and ready to, in a, to revenge or avenge all disobedience. What's the disobedience? The disobedient thoughts or reasonings or anything that's coming to your mind that's disobedient, contrary to the word. And how are you going to be successful in avenging any disobedient thoughts? It's when your obedience is fulfilled. Your obedience to what? Doing what verse 5 says. Casting down the reasonings. Any high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of God? No, we cast it down. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, it is mandatory that you govern your thought life. If you don't govern your thought life, you'll be thinking all kinds of stuff. You could be double-minded. You could be all over the place in your mind, you know. God does not want us to let our mind just run every which way. He wants us to govern our mind with the Word of God and to be thinking on the things that He wants us to think on. Because the devil will try to work you over in your mind all day long if you don't learn to take your thoughts captive. That's absolutely essential. Christians that do not learn how to govern and to, to take their thoughts captive are pretty much defeated because they're going to be double-minded on everything. They're not going to be able to take anything of the, of, the, of the things of God. They won't be able to take hold of things. Their heart won't be pure. They'll be double-minded, see. Now, Colossians chapter 1, verse 5 says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, <clears throat> whereof you have heard before, in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit. The word will bring forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God and truth. So as the word is coming to you, it will bring forth fruit, as long as you keep it and you make sure you're walking in the light of it. Another thing that we see about what the word will do, not only will it bring forth fruit, but we see in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through, or in, or by, the precise, correct knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace aren't automatic. They come as you act upon the Word through the precise, correct knowledge of God. According as His divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, and how does that come to us? Through the precise, correct knowledge, again, of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. So getting the knowledge of God is absolutely essential in your life. And then he goes on and says, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises. And we're supposed to possess those, having the knowledge of God. That by these, you might be partakers of the divine nature. That would be having the mind of Christ and the fruit of Christ, and having the promises coming to pass in our life, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust, because we're not going to yield to anything of the world. We're not going to walk after the lust of the flesh. We're going to walk after heaven's ways. We're going to walk after the ways of the Lord, and that's the ones who possess the promises are the partakers of the divine nature. That means you're not a partaker of the divine nature just because you're born again. You have a spirit that is right with God, but you become a partaker of the divine nature as you possess the exceeding great and precious promises and you escape the corruption that's in the world through lust because you walk in line with the word of God. That is absolutely essential. Now we come down to verse 8. He says, for if these things be in you and abound, and he's, what he's talking about before the things that he listed out here, which is vir virtue, which is moral excellence, knowledge, according to the word, Temperance, which is that which rules the flesh, one of the fruit of the Spirit. Patience, which is what rules the soulish realm, steadfastness in the soulish realm. Godliness, where now you have reverence towards God and because you're a hearer and a doer of the Word. Brotherly kindness, showing love toward all the brotherhood. 
and charity, which is agape, love, showing love towards everybody as we're commanded to walk in love. If you do these things, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the precise, correct knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be fruitful as you do what the Word says. But then, <clears throat> he says, if you lack these things, you're blind. You cannot see afar off, and you've forgotten. You are purged from your old sins. Otherwise, we should be seeing this occur in our life, all this fruitfulness. If not, then there's a problem. He goes on and says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election, which means being chosen, sure. That means it's not sure, but you can make it sure. For if you do, if you are doing these things, this is a present tense verb, if you are continually doing these things, you might never fall, not shall never fall, might never fall. Subjunctive mood verb, meaning, yeah, you, you'll meet the conditions so you never fall. A person could fall, but we don't have to fall. In fact, God will keep us from falling if we walk in line with the Word of God. Now, this brings us to another point, along with this knowledge that it says in Second Peter 2. Notice, if they, after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the precise, correct knowledge, that's how you're going to escape the things of the world. That's how you won't be contaminated by all the evil out there in the world, by walking according to the word of the Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. If they're again entangled therein, uh, if you go back into the ways of the pollutions of the world and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Just like when you cast out demons and if you go back into sin, they come in with seven more wicked or the guy says, you know, Jesus found the guy in John 5, 14, go and sin no more lest the worst thing come on you after he was healed. Well, the same thing is true here. If you've escaped the things of the world and you go back into them, you're going to be worse. You'll be in a worse situation than you were from the beginning. God expects us to walk in his ways. And he expects us to grow in knowledge. Knowledge is going to be something that you're going to be getting and gaining every day as you study the Word of God and you grow. 2 Peter 3, 8, 18. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're to grow up. Now this brings us to another point. God is wanting to raise up the mighty, perfected church, and He will do that in these last days. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For the perfecting, this is the one to grow up, to be furnished, equipped of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God. Unto what? To the perfect man. We're going on into perfection. As you come to the unity of the faith and the precise, correct knowledge, you're never going to come to the perfection of man, the perfect man without having the knowledge of God and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're to grow up to the fullness of Christ. He wants us to grow up and possess all the things that he has for us. In fact, we even see over in Romans chapter 15, he wants us to come to the place of growing up that you and I are all like-minded. Romans chapter 15, verse 5. The God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus. We're to get our mind renewed to the word like-minded, that you may be with one mind, one mouth, Glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know, look at what it's all over the body of Christ. People are all over the place. You got this guy who thinks this way, and somebody else is this, and all over. There's a problem. We have to be taught the truth. That's why we've got to get in the Word of God and find out what's the truth, of course, and get away from all the false traditions of men. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Look what he purposes. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Why would we speak the same thing? Because we're thinking the same thing, because we have the knowledge of the Word. That there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together 
in the same mind, in the same judgment, or the same uh, uh, view or uh, and outlook on things, this refers to. We're to become in one accord. That's what God wants. Now, in light of all this, we need to go over and look at Philippians 3. You and I are a work in progress. And he wants to accomplish this great work, and he will do it as you get the word in you and be a doer of it. Look what we see here in Philippians chapter 3. Paul speaking. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things, but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. He wanted to get the knowledge of God, so he knew the ways of the Lord. Everything else didn't meant nothing. He lost everything. It didn't matter. He counted as dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. And how are we going to get to the place of knowing him? By getting the knowledge of God and getting understanding of his ways and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death as we die out to everything that's not of the Lord and we walk in the ways of the Lord. That by any means, now this is quite a statement he makes, that I might arrive at or come to, this is what the word means, attain or arrive to, the resurrection of the dead. Meaning, it wasn't a guaranteed deal for him. It wasn't set for him. He says, not as though I had already taken this, the word lambano, either were already perfect. He was a work in progress too. He hadn't come to perfection yet. But I, what's he doing? But I follow after. This is the Greek word dioko, which means to run after something, uh, to, to run swiftly towards reaching a goal be the better way to think of it in this sense. He's running after this goal to become a, a perfection. If that I may lay hold of, this word means apprehend or lay hold of, catalambano, that for which I have been laid hold of of Christ Jesus. He purchased us, now we're to go forth and lay hold of what he has for us. Brethren, I count not myself to have laid hold of it. But this one thing I do, I'm forgetting the things that are behind. Now, if you are beaten over the head by the enemy out of things of the past, stop it. Let it all go. Cast everything from the past and forget all this stuff that's happened. Get your eyes on Jesus. You are going to be fixed on him and you're going towards the goal of getting the mind of Christ and growing up and conquering, overcoming, fruitfulness, possessing promises, partaker of the divine nature, victory in everything. Let go of everything in the past. And I'm reaching forth unto those things that are before. And when he talks about reaching forth, this means he's stretching himself out towards it. I mean, he's not just, you know, just aimlessly going along, you know. No, he's after it. You need to get yourself set, yourself fixed, where you are headed to possess everything that God has for you in your life. And he says, I press, same word, Dioko. I'm running after for this, to, to, to reach this goal, towards the goal for the victor award, the award to the victor. This word means goal. This prize means the award to the victor. Otherwise, I'm going for the goal of the award to the victor of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Meaning, if I'm going to come to this high calling, I've got to get the victory. And I've got to get the victory over the flesh. I've got to get the victory over sin. I've got to get the victory over the world. I've got to get a victory over the devils. I've got to get the victory and possess the promises of God, get the mind of Christ, and stretch myself out to possess everything that God has for me. That is to be your mindset. That's where we're headed. And that's where we are going to. Let us therefore as many as be perfect, to be perfect. We're going on to be perfected. We're going on to perfection. Be thus minded. If any be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, what you've attained to already, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Don't let anything slip otherwise. Wherever you've already attained in your walk, that should be your, incorporated in your lifestyle, the way you're walking continuously. Don't ever let it slip. Don't ever fall back from the things that you're, you've already attained. 
Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk as you have for us an example. For many walk. That's quite a statement. Not a few. Many walk, of whom I've, I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Born again Christians that were enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? Because the flesh was running them and their mind wasn't tuned in properly, as you'll see. Whose end is destruction. That's quite a statement. Whose God is their belly. Their flesh is running them. Whose glory is in their shame and who mind earthly things. How can you ever grow up and arrive to perfection if you're minding earthly things? You won't. Remember it says, seek the things above, not the things on the earth. You and I are going to get our mind on the things that God has for us. God wants you to get yourself set. I am running this race to obtain everything that God has for me. And if you'll get your mind on the things of the Lord, you're going to stay in peace in your life. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Thou wilt keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. You can stay in peace at all times. That means if we get stressed out, flustered, frustrated, care, anxiety, upset, down, depressed, you know, that's not peace. That means our mind must have been influenced by something else that got to us. You got to be ready to take those thoughts captive, be ready to cast that down, be ready to the obedience of Christ to get your mind thinking on the good things. Even when you have those feelings coming at you, you can still get your mind on the things of the Lord and be doing what God wants, resisting the enemy, of course, and thinking on what God wants. Take those thoughts captive and get your mind fixed on what he wants. Otherwise, you could easily start giving place to that and let the enemy work in your life. Notice, you'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. It's supported, leaned up against on thee. In fact, it says, because he trusteth in thee. That tells you something. Whatever your mind is thinking upon and leaned up against, it must be what you must be trusting in. You show you trust in the Lord when your mind is stayed on Him. Get your, don't trust in your own ability. Don't trust in your own way of figuring things out. Trust in the Lord. Trust in Him, what He'll tell you to do. What He shows you to do, what He's bringing to you. This is why when, you, you know, when you're in a situation and all of a sudden scriptures come up to your mind, that's the Lord showing you things. Or you start praying and then he brings these thoughts. Now when the devil comes, you just resist those thoughts. You cast them down. You resist them. You think on what the word says and keep thinking the word and praying the word and speaking the word and doing the word. And then you'll conquer those things and they'll leave. But you are going to have a little bit of a battle because they're not going to want to leave easily, especially if you've given place to them continually. This is where you've got to learn to really war against anything that comes against your mind and not give place to it. If you are a pushover for the enemy and you don't let those things stay in your mind and just kind of ignore them, that's what some people do. Well, that's a mistake. You need to cast those thoughts down. You need to resist those thoughts and replace them with the Word of God. And then start speaking the Word, praying the Word, doing the Word, thinking on what God wants. Get your mind on the Word of God. Remember that when you do so, then the, you'll guard your mind and heart and mind through Christ Jesus and you'll stay in perfect peace at all times in your life. God wants a spiritual mind. And remember, regarding casting out the demons, we cast out the demons, but we also replace the thoughts. We think on good things. We get our mind thinking on what's going on, what, what God says, in the, even in the face of attacks coming against you. You keep your mind set on the word. That is critical so you don't give place to the enemies in your life. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God that declares that I am to obtain the mind of Christ. And I can obtain the mind of Christ so that I will know the Lord. I thank you that I am going to get the Word of God in my life, hearing it, thinking on it, seeing it, speaking it, 
keeping it before me. My mind is going to be renewed as I'm transformed through the renewing of my mind. The mind of Christ is going to get established in me. I thank you for bringing revelation by the Holy Spirit, opening my mind to be able to understand the scriptures. I thank you that as I am hearing and doing the word, that I will get filled with the knowledge of God and I'll walk in it to obtain understanding and wisdom. I thank you that as I'm hearing and doing the word, I will not give place to any of the desires of the flesh. My mind will think what the word says in every situation, so I do not give place to the thoughts coming from the flesh or desires from the flesh. I will cast them down. I will cast down reasonings. I will bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I will not give place to negative thoughts in my mind. I will keep my focus on the things of the Spirit, not on the flesh. I will not be double-minded. I will take that thought captive and I will think on what the Word says. I thank you that as my mind is renewed to the Word of God, I am obtaining the mind of Christ and I will guard my mind so no evil thoughts are coming in to bring double-mindedness or confusion. I will think on things that are lovely, things that are pure, things that are righteous, things that have virtue, things that are of a good report, things that are in line with the truth. I will think on what the Word says, and I will govern my mind. And I am pressing forward to the perfect man, getting my mind renewed to the Word of God, bringing forth fruit, possessing the promises, becoming a partaker of the divine nature. I thank you, Lord, that as I keep my mind upon you, you'll keep me in perfect peace. I put the word of God first place. And I thank you that as I am hearing your word and doing your word, seeking the things above, I will not mind earthly things. I will mind heavenly things. And I will walk in the spirit. Thank you. I'm putting on the new man, I'm putting off the old man, and I will see the mind of Christ established in me, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God, he will do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. Thank you that every one of us sees the importance of getting the word in us and doing what your word says so we see the mind of Christ established in every single one of us. We thank you. There'll be much fruit from this. In Jesus' name, amen.